Hello and welcome back to the Ebby Online podcast. I'm excited to welcome this week's guest once again as I am joined this week by HG Tudor who has returned to speak about his childhood. As I wanted to understand how one might become a narcissist and HG gave an in-depth insight into it. HG was my first podcast guest, so I was delighted to have him back on as he always causes a stir with my listeners and helps them to identify narcissists and abusers in their own lives. As I always say, I love psychology. So I've been researching once again into cluster B personalities as I've interviewed a few people that have been diagnosed as borderline and antisocial over the past two years. During this podcast, we discuss what careers have high numbers of those who may have narcissistic tendencies after various studies conducted by researchers have looked into this. So stick around to see if your career made the list. We also discuss the ongoing speculation that Meghan Markle might be a narcissist and HG Tudor breaks down why he thinks she scores highly on the spectrum due to her behaviours. And we also speak about grandiose narcissist Andrew Tate. Continue to listen to find out more about the mind of a psychopath. I hope you enjoy and don't forget to give my podcast a rating and a follow. I greatly appreciate it. What inspired you to start creating content about narcissism and cluster B personalities? When I first came to the subject, I knew a fair amount of information about myself naturally. And I decided to have a look around on the internet to see what other people were writing and saying. And I saw that there was a lot of misinformation a lot of gaps in the information, a lot of myths about my kind. And that simply, in a way, offended me. Part of me wanted to correct that. Furthermore, the motivation do, as you know, a narcissist seeks four things, either consciously or subconsciously, control, fuel, character traits, and residual benefits, what I call the prime aims. And two most important aspects of that are control and fuel. And at some point, although it's a long way away, I'm going to die. And that's the ultimate threat to my control. And therefore, to neutralize that threat to control, I decided that one way of doing so would be to create a vast body of work which is unrivaled in its depth of understanding and applicability to people's lives. So that when I shuffle off this mortal coil, that I will live on through that work. Now, some people have said to me, well, how can you? It's because you'll be known as a pseudonym. That doesn't matter. At that point, when the Grim Reaper pops up with his adamantine scythe and says, this is it, then I can look him squarely in the eye and say, well, I will live on in some form through my work. Therefore, that nullifies that threat to control. And having that knowledge means that that ultimate threat to control is neutralized. So the two motivations for doing this is to ensure that people have the right information about my kind, because I find the misinformation staggering and uh, offensive, and also the creation of my legacy for the reasons that I've just outlined. What is your diagnosis and why did you end up seeking one? I know you said in in previous interviews, an ex-girlfriend at university said you were a narc. Can you expand on this further? So an ex-girlfriend who uh, was a psychology graduate basically took me to one side and without real judgment said, I believe that you've got, uh, that you're a narcissist and a psychopath. (coughs) And I smiled and said, you're still full of charm, aren't you? Uh, That sounds very interesting. Tell me more. Because I'm always interested in me, I allowed her to explain. And much of what she said resonated with me. Naturally, I wasn't going to give her the satisfaction of going, do you know what? You're absolutely right. Good girl. I said, well, that's all very interesting. I must be about other matters now. Toodle pip. And off I went. And I went and looked it up. And I sat down with some books and uh, read further and thought, that does make sense. Now, I'd known certain aspects of what I am for a long time. For instance, I know, I've always known that I like controlling people. I'd always known that I get off on uh, manipulating people that I find it entertaining to screw with people because I get bored very quickly. I've always known that I don't care about people. I've always known that I've been set apart and superior to them. 
but I never had a name for all of the, the collective behaviours. So she provided me with that. And then in due course, as a consequence of my involvement with the good doctors, I was provided with a formal diagnosis. Not that I needed that, but there it is. What was the diagnosis? Was it social... Narcissistic personality disorder and antisocial personality disorder. So, which is, uh, of course, there's no specific diagnosis given by the professionals of psychopathy. But that's essentially what it is. And would you describe yourself as somatic, covert or elite? What, what, would you, what do you see yourself as? Well, I don't like the term covert as a description of a narcissist because I find it uh, way too wide. Um, there are covert behaviours, absolutely. But my classification, that I use in my own lexicon, is that in terms of my cadre, it's elite, which is an amalgam of both somatic and cerebral. So I like the fine things in life. I like the beautiful people. So I don't want to be seen with a bag of hammers. I want an attractive partner on my arm. I like to live in a splendid house. I wear nice clothing. I'm ruggedly handsome and take care of myself. I'm not roided up and uh, completely ripped and buffed in that respect, but I'm athletic, so I look after myself. But I like the arts. I'm, I play chess. I, I'm well read. I'm interested in politics, current affairs, etc. So I have an interest in many cerebral things. I can play musical instruments and so forth. So I have an, I'm an amalgam of two of those things. So my cadre is that of elite. My school is that of ultra, which I have. And that's per my classification. Because I'm self-aware. I know what I am. But also, my level of insight is such that I'm able to understand so much about my kind and convey that information to other people which is highly unusual. And many narcissists are not able to introspect as you have and, and actually admit that they are narcissistic? That's right. The vast majority uh, are prevented from acknowledging what they are because their form of narcissism doesn't allow it. It's almost as if they're not trusted to know. Uh, I'm trusted to know because I don't go around with people that I know in my private life going, hello, my name's John Smith. It's not my name, but hello, I'm John Smith and I'm a narcissistic psychopath because only an idiot would do that. I tell all of you what I am because you don't know who I am. That's the beauty of why I keep my identity secret to prevent it causing a problem for me in my private life and to enable me to give you all of these disclosures because you don't know who I am. So I can be entirely honest with you. That is actually one of my questions because I wanted to know if you've ever divulged to a romantic interest about your diagnosis because no. some narcissists will do this and uh -huh. is it a type of manipulation tactic because it might hinder further, you know, I don't know, things that you want to do, like your, your aims in the future. You won't be able to succeed them if you do tell someone. You're, you're entirely correct. Why on earth would I admit to somebody what I am? Because the diagnosis is, stig is stigmatic and it would cause them to react in an unfavorable fashion, thus threatening my sense of control. So only an idiot would say, oh, I'm this, because there'd be a transference of power to them by giving that information. So one wouldn't do so. So what happens is where you get uh, a narcissist that says, oh, this is my diagnosis. of what they are but they they think they're more than they actually are so what you often have is you have an unaware narcissist that believes that they are aware and you have quite a few of these that turn up on tiktok and youtube where they claim that they are an aware narcissist that has healed in actual fact they're either not a narcissist and, and have thought that they are but they're not and they might have had some other problems which they've overcome or they are a narcissist. They're unaware as to the type they actually are. They think they are aware, but they're not. And what they're doing is by saying, oh, I'm cured when they're not, they're manipulating their audience. And it's an, an instinctive subconscious manipulation. And in the same way, a narcissist might say to his girlfriend, yeah, uh, you know, I've been diagnosed as a narcissist. That is a, a disclosure that an aware narcissist would never make. And what's happening there is that the unaware narcissism is allowing that unaware narcissist to give away the diagnosis 
in order to try and engender a sympathetic response from the victim. I've seen, as you said, people on TikTok, there are quite a few big ones. Um, I won't name drop them. You obviously know who they are. But they have told their partners, even Sam Vatnin's partner knows that yeah. he's a narcissist and she chooses to be with him. And I think that in previous interviews, she said that her father was like that. So she's kind of used to it and she's happy to stay and let him just do what he wants. Well, yes, and you've got to question the mindset of an individual that does that when they've been, they're not really fixed with the knowledge of what they're dealing with. They're not actually using logic because if you'd apply cold, hard logic to the situation, you would remove yourself. So an individual that makes a conscious decision to remain with a narcissist is using flawed logic and they're being affected by what I term emotional thinking, which isn't being caught in hysteria or anything like that. It's your, you're making decisions governed by your emotions, and they're not good ones. Because generally speaking, emotion-based decision-making is flawed. It doesn't give you the right outcome. Right, back to your childhood and back to your growing up. I know you said you suffered abuse at the hands of your mother as a child, who you yes. also believed to be a narc. Aside from that, what was your childhood like, and how has it shaped you into the man you are today? My childhood was one, as you've identified, where I was abused, both physically, sexually and emotionally. However, I grew up in a nice house, a large house, with uh, all of the trappings of uh, a comfortable middle-class upbringing. Uh, other aspects of the family, uh, my mother's brother, he's particularly wealthy, uh, being a, a big wig in the confectionery industry. Willy Wonka, as I call him. And so there was considerable wealth there. Uh, we moved in circles uh, on a sort of regional basis that uh, allowed influence to be extended, which was something which delighted my mother and naturally uh, catered to her prime aims. I have sort of clouded memories of my childhood. It's rather than being a continuum it's often like you know when you uh, have uh, machines in amusement arcades and on piers and things like that and fairs the, the grabber that comes down grabs a toy and then you try and take it out and invariably the rascally fairground owner has fixed the machine so that the grabber is very loose and it always drops it but you keep trying and waste all your money but it's a little bit like that going along and plucking a memory from one place and then from another so with my childhood, a lot of there was a huge emphasis upon achievement, both academically and sporting. And uh, I was pushed heavily by my mother in order to uh, achieve. And I was very much the achiever of the family. Um, my father spent more of his time involved with his job, but also in terms of shielding my brother and sister from my mother's behaviour and leaving me essentially to my own devices. And I think that he recognized that I was different um, because he basically said that I was capable of looking after myself, which of course is nonsense for a small boy. But I think what he was driving at is that he recognized that I behaved differently and somehow that enabled me to deal with what I was having to be subjected to. So he I wouldn't be right to say that he washed his hands of me um, but he was less involved with me in terms of shielding me than he was with regard to my siblings. But outwardly, we had what would be seen as a an excellent childhood. Uh, money, uh, a grand house, access to lots of different events and going to lots of different places, being exposed to lots of different experiences, uh, well known in the local community, etc., um, so many people would think that, you know, it was a sort of privileged, um, sort of middle class, upper middle class upbringing. Um, we interacted with a variety of uh, interesting and well-known characters, some of whom were quite famous. Um, and um, what I, the behaviours that I saw in relation to my mother, when she interacted with other people, 
in a sense, also forged an understanding of how power is so useful. I would see the way that people would scurry around her, kowtowing to her. And I thought, well, I want that. I want people to respond to me in the way that they respond to her. She was very well regarded by many people because of the facade that she operated and still operates to this day. So did, that's a bit of a snapshot of uh, an aspect of my childhood. Did you go to boarding school? No. I was going to say, because I've seen a lot of stuff on boarding school and how it helps people to turn off their emotions, like people in, in Parliament and things like that, and it kind of drums it into them to just succeed at their own aims. But I'll leave that to one side. What uh -huh. kind of antisocial behaviours did you engage in during your youth? Did you start fires, get into fights, or did you use manipulation tactics to succeed at your aims? Fire has always had a particular fascination for me. <laughs> Why is that? I'm sorry. <laughs> because it's in all of the books and I just don't understand. It's beautiful watching a conflagration that you've created and the power that's associated with it. The beauty of flame is that it's all-encompassing. It doesn't distinguish, does it? It burns everything that it touches, whether that's flesh, fur, wood, whatever it is. So to be able from just the striking of a match to watch that yellowy-orange flame spring into life and then apply it to the oil-soaked rag, petrol-soaked rag, which then lights up with those dancing blue flame underneath the orange and yellow and then pause for a moment to recognize that in your hand you have that power of that molotov cocktail and then to hurl it towards the target that then explodes and the flames take and then to watch as the flames start to eat their way across the facade of that building and then eventually start to encroach through the windows and perhaps some old curtains there suddenly go up and it becomes more powerful until you can hear the roaring of the flames and then the air is shimmering and you can feel the heat against your face. So it's the power that's associated with it and the, the cleansing nature of it, because as I mentioned, it doesn't distinguish between anything. It gets rid of all things in its path, uh, which is fairly similar to the way that I function, that if you get in my way, then I will disincentivize you. So I think probably I recognised in the flames a similarity between it and the way that I behaved. And therefore, it, I viewed it as an extension of me, I would imagine. So setting fires was a big part of what I did as a child. And uh, I've written about it and spoken about it to a, a small degree in some of my work. And we'll revisit that uh, to a greater extent. There was some uh, thieving that went on. Uh, I would get into fights and uh, sometimes I lost, but more usually I bested them and then learned and over time refined things because I recognised that it wasn't particularly clever to turn up at school with a blackened eye and a bloody nose because it would invite too many questions. And therefore, I'm not a coward at all. Indeed, fear is not an issue for me. But I recognise that too many questions is ultimately threatening of my control and therefore it's much better and more fun in a way to get somebody to do something without necessarily having to apply force where it's net where i deem that it's appropriate i will do so but in most many instances i see a particular finesse in getting the appropriate outcome through the application of charm or uh, bamboozling somebody through intellect or the promise of gain for them and causing them to do what I want as a consequence primarily of the words that I use uh, that's uh, far more rewarding and more elegant than punching somebody in the face how do you experience feelings and what type of emotions do you have because I know many psychologists say that narcissists can't even love their own children can you uh -huh. explain a bit more on how you empathize or you feel emotions sadness pain loss regret happiness okay i experience pain 
So prior to Christmas, I was involved in a serious incident in the line of duty, which had me hospitalised. And uh, that certainly stung a bit. So I experienced pain. I don't do regret. It's pointless. Serves no purpose. I don't do happiness. I don't experience that or sadness. I experience fury. I experience antipathy and hatred. Infatuation. I don't experience uh, joy. And many people will often comment about, oh, that's such a shame. And I go, no, because it doesn't serve any purpose to me. And I'm effective as I am. So I do experience certain emotions, not as many as other people. In terms of empathy, I feel nothing for people. In fact, I find people as a whole irritating. I look upon many human beings and wish that they'd be eradicated because they offer nothing. They're base and pleasant, stupid, and for much of the world would be better off with the large sections of the population removed. Um, I can be away from people for quite a period of time, but because I am both narcissist and psychopath, I need fuel from people, not as much as a pure narcissist does. So you have a pure psychopath, you have me as a narcissistic psychopath, and you have a pure narcissist. So I don't need as much fuel. And uh, narcissists are more emotionally volatile than I am. And I have learned to express certain emotions. So, for instance, I learn to show indignation, learn to exhibit frustration or glee, but it's manufactured because it's done in order to fit in. So, for instance, when I make my videos, I have learned that in, to better communicate, that rather than speak in a flat effect that modulating one's voice and adding cadence and emphasis makes for a better listener experience and so I have observed and listened to other people in how they behave by expressing surprise and indignation and emphasis and so forth and have acquired those traits by observation and apply them in the way that I conduct myself both in terms of the creation of my material and also with regard to my day-to-day -day dealings with other people so that I'm able to fit in. So I do experience emotions, but they're on a far more limited spectrum and scale compared to you, for example. So have you never, like, put on your favourite song and you just feel, like, overcome with joy or...? No. <laughs> never, not even close to it, you don't experience, like, a warm happy feeling you've, no. you've never had that no and have your parents said when you were a child like did you did they comment on you not being happy i replicated it in some instances uh, i know my father and um, this is more from recollections of what he's told me when we were adults rather than remembering it at the time he would say that I was always worried about you, HG, because you never looked happy. And I would just explain to him, didn't need it. And it was more that I remember my brother and sister. They would often think that I was an alien and they would effectively refer to me as such because I wouldn't respond in the same way that they would do. And I would ask questions of them. And I'd say, why are you jumping up and down? It's because they were excited and they would look at me as if to say, what kind of question is that? But I've always had an intellectual curiosity as to why people do as they do. That's just the way that I am. And of course, it's part of making me more effective because by understanding people, it makes it easier for me to do what I need to do with them. And so with my brother and sister, I remember seeing somebody crying and I would say, why is water leaking from their face? And they say, they're crying. And I said, what's that? And they both looked at me with amusement. But I learned. And then thereafter, I understood what it was. So I recognised that when somebody was crying, uh, that they were suffering some kind of hurt, perhaps a physical pain, or then later learning it was an emotional pain. 
Then I also learned that, of course, people experience tears of joy, which was interesting to find that there were flavours of tears, if you will. And have you, like, practised your emotions in the mirror? Can you make yourself cry on tap, like an actor? I have practised my sort of facial responses and tone of voice, you know, to show, for instance, concern, uh, to show delight and, and, and such like. Um not so much with crying, because I regard that as a weakness. So if I really needed to, I could possibly squeeze a tear out. But I potentially might have a prolapse at the same time. And how do you seek out your victims? What are you looking for? And have you ever been in a situation where someone apart from your ex-girlfriend at university, have they ever realised what you are? I think, to answer the second question first... I think there are some instances where people realise there's something, in inverted commas, wrong or different about me. They don't necessarily realise that I'm a narcissistic psychopath. They just recognise that the way that I treat them is abnormal and problematic. And therefore, when it's happened on a repeated basis, they form the conclusion there's something just not right about me. But they don't turn around and say, oh, you're a narcissistic psychopath. And with the first question, how, what's your, well, for you personally, what type of victim do you like? Do you like rich, wealthy women? Do you like women you can gain something off of? Do you like emotional, empathetic women? Um, what's your... Well, I don't, I don't just interact, of course, with women. Uh, I choose women as my intimate partners. Um, but my victims will come from both male and female, young and old, etc., because anybody that I interact with, I have to control. Now, I may have a brief interaction with them, achieve the control that's required, draw some fuel from them, and then move on and may never have anything to do with them ever again. But somebody that I would specifically target, it's a combination of factors. Um, with regard to being the narcissist, of course, I, I need to obtain control. But my psychopathy also relates into needing to control that person. Fuel is simply an aspect of my narcissism. The character traits come from the narcissism as part of the creation of the construct. And the residual benefits are linked both to my narcissism and psychopathy. One of the residual benefits is alleviating the boredom that I experience, which comes from my psychopathy. So in terms of selecting a victim, there are individuals where, in essence, one can just tell that they're ripe for being a victim. And the reason that one can tell is that some people would say, oh, it's a, it's a feeling, it's a hunch. It isn't. It's a subconscious assimilation of the behaviour and mannerisms of that individual, which I, as a predator, have had attuned so that I'm effective in the same way that a lioness is able to pick out which gazelle to take down. It doesn't sit there and think about it. It just knows, but it's picking up on signals that I do in the same way. But I amalgamate the two. So what I do is I, through what I am, assimilate that information and also part of its way that I've trained and then I consciously look for aspects as well in terms of the person showing emotional empathy. And I break the traits down into empathic traits, class traits and special traits. So some of the things that you've touched on would be what I would specify as class traits. So if somebody's wealthy, do they have access to certain networks? Um, are they physically attractive? Those are class traits. So there are certain things that I prefer. So I really don't like unintelligent people. So if I was to select somebody to be an intimate partner primary source, they're going to have to be intelligent. They would need to be beautiful. Money, as long as they're not a pauper, I'm not particularly driven by that because I've got money of my own. Uh, if they've got some, good. Uh, I don't want someone that's sponging off me the whole time, but I will be generous where I deem it appropriate. I like that person to have style and to have an appreciation of dressing well. Somebody takes pride in their appearance. 
I want somebody that's well read and has an appreciation of the arts and history and music and such like. So uh, a, a base individual that's a slack jawed mouth breather is not somebody that I'm going to target. Not in the sense of having a relationship with. Of course, there are other people that can be played with who are the epsilon semi-morons where I quite delight to make in their life a misery and they thoroughly deserve it. On to romantic partners. How are narcissists able to juggle multiple people and play different characters with various romantic partners? Is it not draining? Why do narcs treat, cheat with multiple people instead of finding one? Because it seems like they just swap people in and out and always have another person lined up when they leave someone. Okay. The narcissist often has somebody else lined up, but not always. And having somebody else lined up is often the catalyst for the first relationship ending, because that's a disengagement trigger. So in many instances, you'll say, oh, it seems like they've always got somebody lined up. Indeed, because the narcissism has guided them to have an affair with somebody because they have no emotional empathy for the person they're in a relationship with. And the narcissism causes us to regard the person that we're in a relationship with as having let us down. Now, from their perspective, they have not done so. But from our perspective, they have. And that legitimizes conducting an affair. Now, sometimes that affair will rumble on with no real conclusion. And it could go on for years and the narcissist stays with the person that they're having the primary relationship with. In other instances... The narcissism detects that the person they're having an affair with is easy to control and caters very well to fuel character traits and residual benefits and therefore basically says, make them the primary source and get rid of the existing one. So the swap occurs. We're designed to be able to deal with this. Now, some narcissists aren't as skilled at doing it as others. They make schoolboy or schoolgirl errors and get caught out. Not that they're unduly concerned by that, save that it being a threat to control. There's no remorse, there's no conscience, there's no guilt, even though if they appear to suggest that they feel guilty, that's just another form of manipulation. But a shark is able to swim and catch its prey because that's the way that it's designed to do it. Ask a human to do that in the sea and they'd struggle. Ask a narcissist to go juggle multiple people for the purposes of ensuring they're controlled and draw fuel from them. We're able to do it. Why? Because that's what we're designed to do. Because we're not... We are not... Um, fettered by remorse or guilt or conscience. We're driven by a need to draw fuel from them. We're driven by the need um, to control those individuals and we have the knowledge that what we're doing is appropriate and right. We are allowed to go after them because you have let us down. From our perspective, you have failed us and therefore it's right that we've picked somebody else out. It also seems like narcissists thrive off of negative fuel. I know they thrive off of positive fuel as well, like okay. people giving them compliments and doing nice things for them. But is negative fuel more potent than positive fuel? It is. So as I've written about in my excellent book, Fuel, which you've identified, we receive positive fuel. So saying, I love you, or offering somebody a packet of sweets, or giving them a bank rub, or telling them how wonderful they are, or clapping and cheering them, those are examples of positive fuel. Negative fuel is somebody crying because we've upset them, and somebody sitting in a sulk because we've ignored them. And uh, that negative fuel is more powerful, it's more potent, because it's easy to make people like you, but it's more fun and more entertaining to get somebody to react negatively to you, but still hang around, and that demonstrates more real power interesting i'm gonna get into the second half now before we jump mm -hmm. into celebrities i'd like to know what careers do narcissists flock to because there was a study done a few years ago saying that people like sh chefs surgeons some even say journalists score high on the narc meter but in my own experience working in the newsroom i'm yet to come across like someone that I would call a narcissist in the industry 
Um, I've come across people that can't take criticism, which I know can be a red flag. But I feel like in this industry, you should be able to take criticism and feedback. And uh -huh. but I know some narcissists can't can't take accountability. <laughs> so, what what type of industries do you think narcissists, people with psychopathic tendencies, are drawn to? Well, it might be that you've not come across any in your newsroom because you work for the Daily Empath. So you may just be fortunate that there aren't any there. But journalism is uh, an area that attracts our kind. Uh, medicine is one, doctors and surgeons, both in terms of narcissists and psychopaths. Indeed, you would want a uh, psychopath operating on you because the psychopath doesn't regard you as a person. You are uh, a playing field on which to show off his talents. And the hyper-focus that we have is precisely what you need at that juncture that he needs to be focused on delivery of the surgery so that you survive and he's not concerned about you as an individual but ensuring that he performs and that he's able to do so without any of the um, considerations that might hinder that perfect execution Just observance of his talents. Other areas, politics is an obvious one. Uh, that attracts many of our kind because of the fact that wielding political power enables you to control possibly hundreds of millions, if not billions of people. It allows lots of fuel to be drawn. There's access to so many different character traits. And of course, oodles of residual benefits. The management of a facade, huge amounts of money, influence, networks so politics is uh, one that's very much uh, a nest of narcissists uh, the entertainment industry part of that of course is the uh, you have certain narcissists that revel in showing off and therefore being able to do that and essentially not feel silly when doing so is a positive attribute of course uh, being able to take on different roles by being act an actor uh, enable someone to be that show person on the stage and obviously literally be an actor if they go into that profession. It allows lots of control by having a rapt audience and then, of course, becoming potentially famous. Fuel, of course, for people's reactions to you, shouting your name and clapping and cheering you. Um, character trait acquisition, taking on the aspects of other people to be that performer, being an amalgam of others. And again, residual benefits in terms of money and networks and facade. So the entertainment industry is big. So that would be pop stars, rock stars, actors and actresses, uh, authors. Uh, you'd also have uh, the law and law enforcement because, of course, wielding power through the application of law and in some instances being responsible for somebody's livelihood and in certain jurisdictions their life if they're facing the death sentence that of course is particularly powerful the ability to pass sentence on somebody so being in the law as a judge that also allows access to the crime aims so you'll find that uh, there are certain many professions which attract our kind uh, and you, you will find that there's many narcissists that are involved in it the world of business of course as well uh, the ability to create a company that then of course that wields power over those employees and its customers fuel from all of their responses the wealth that comes with all of that being seen as a titan of industry and the prominence that affords so maybe whether it's tech entrepreneur or uh, the inheritance of an existing uh, perhaps more traditional industry again getting there and of course to get to the top of these professions and industries, etc., uh, invariably, though not always, but invariably are kind of suited to that because of there's the drive to succeed, because that brings with it the rewards of the prime aims and the ability not to be concerned about trampling on other people and casting them to one side and being affected by hurting people's feelings because those things hinder. So there's many attributes that the narcissist that ensure that we're quite ideal to get to the top in many of these industries and sectors and professions. And certain ones are certainly festooned with our kind more than others. 
uh, those are just a few that spring to mind in the context of today's discussion. Can you explain why many people believe Meghan Markle is a narcissist due to her isolating Prince Harry from the royal family? And do you think <laughs> Prince Harry will ever leave her and return to the UK? What's your opinion? Well, the short answer is you can go and watch all of my videos about her on my YouTube channel, which give you oodles of evidence as to why she is what she is. But in essence, she operates with the sense of entitlement. She believes that she's allowed to pass proclamation about other people, but they are not allowed to criticise her. If you criticise her, you're deemed to be a racist and a hater or a misogynist. She's manipulative. She utilises a range of manipulations. Uh, primarily pity plays, uh, fake charm, uh, fake empathy. She's not hugely charming, but she likes to think that she is. She operates a facade of believing that she's a kind and empathic person and that she actually cares, although her actions demonstrate that she doesn't. She has no accountability for her actions. She repeatedly tells lies, revises history. She acquires character traits from other people, which has been seen with many of the things that she's said and done, but she's cut and paste them from other individuals, whether it be out-and-out -out plagiarism or simply uh, copying that has gone on in terms of taking somebody else's idea or anecdote and making it seem that it was applicable to her. Uh, she shows a haughtiness in the way that she's uh, purportedly bullied people, that she has uh, arrogant with her responses, that she's dismissive with regard to people. She shares magical thinking. She believes that she's hugely successful. She believes, in essence, that everybody thinks she's wonderful, and if you don't, there must be something wrong with you, and thus you are a hater and a racist and a misogynist. So there's so many indicators which support that she's a narcissist, and I've set them out in the many videos that I've done about her. So it would probably take me a good two or three hours to go through them all at a time which we don't have, so I would direct people to the video and as you've identified one of the things that she's also done is alienate prince harry from interfering influences now this is a common manipulative behavior of the narcissist in order to assert control over the intimate partner primary source which is what harry is i.e someone who's relatively easy to control has lots of fuel has access to character traits and residual benefits her narcissism detects other people family for instance friends as likely to interfere in that control because they might pick up on her behaviours not quite being appropriate or right or nice and therefore might be moved to say something about it. William, for example, identifying that mm, this is moving a little bit quick here and one should be a little bit mindful of that. The Princess of Wales, similarly not being particularly drawn to Harry's wife and picking up on the behaviours of thinking there's a bit of falsity uh, that goes around her, the friends thinking that she's a bit nuts, etc. And so, consequence of all of that, the friends and family members, and of course her family members, know what she's like because they've li lived it, and they could tell the truth of that, which will similarly cause a threat to control. So in order to maintain control over Harry, she has to isolate him from what she sees as those adverse influences. And therefore, she does it with a combination of smearing those individuals. X has said this about me, so he's horrible, isn't he, Harry? Oh, yeah, OK, absolutely, whatever you say, my little pumpkin. And in other instances, saying to Harry, um, these people are being horrible. You don't want me to suffer the same fate as your mum. You need to protect me. And of course, that is goes to the core of Harry, because his mother's death has had such an impact upon him. It really is like reaching inside of him and squeezing him with that particular manipulation so that you're always able to get him to sort of jump to attention. Oh, right, yeah, protect you from paparazzi. Absolutely must do that. So she can play that card repeatedly. And then to say, it's you and I. And she's drawn him into their awful shared fantasy, the folie d'eau that they have, whereby he has become mesmerised by her. He has swallowed the poison that she's poured in his ear about other people and accepted it. He believes that she's right. She, he believes the pity plays that she's doled out in terms of maintaining that people have been awful to her. And in some instances they have, but with justification. But what she does is she edits that and trims out her behaviour, which meant that that person was horrible to her. And the film starts with her just being treated badly. And she says, I haven't done anything wrong, but look, Kate made me cry and revises history. 
whereas she may well have been crying as a consequence of the fact that Kate fought back because she was horrible to Kate in the first place. So she has completely duped him, and with the application of what I call spicy poontang and false compassion for him, has created this fantasy world for him whereby he truly believes that she absolutely adores him and understands him because she mirrored his likes and dislikes, caused him to feel special. Because even though he's been protected for years by the royal family, he has felt a bit of an outsider. And therefore, this lady has come along and made him feel ultra special. So when he's seen his brother happy, he's thinking, hey, I can have that now as well. I can be like Big Willie Stiley. Fantastic. So she's shown him all of the things that resonate with him as part of the mirroring that goes on and the illusion that's created. And he's fallen hook, line and sinker for it. And at the same time, she has smeared those who might be adverse influences upon him and weakened their involvement with him and kept him away from anybody that knows the reality of what she is, which, of course, she doesn't accept. She just perceives them as liars that are a threat to her control. And she can't understand why her family members insist on being so awful about her because she doesn't realise that's the truth because she's blinded to it. And all of this has created a heavy brute which she has uh, caused Harry to drink deep of, and thus he has become totally ensnared by her. Do you think that he will ever come back to the UK and become a, a senior member of the royal family and play his role fully? The way that that will happen will be as a consequence of her disengaging from him, which I see as likely. I don't see that he will escape. I think that she will get rid of him. And then he'll be torn because assuming that the children do exist, because obviously there's some people who believe that they don't, <laughs> let us say that they do, he would probably want to try and stay in the United States to see his children. But then it would lead to a very lonely existence for him. So it might well be that he would look to come back to the United Kingdom and perhaps shuttle between the two places, or even, if possible, take steps to bring the children to the United Kingdom with him. Of course, she will fight him on that. But he, she will disengage from him and he has no real connection to the United States. He, he's got in-laws, but they will soon retreat from him. He doesn't really, he doesn't have a proper job there. He doesn't understand the culture at all. It's been shown by his ridiculous announcements. You know, the First Amendment is bonkers. And Blighty is his home. So if it were to go wrong, and it likely it will do in terms of her disengaging from him, then the most likely outcome is subject to the buffer caused by the children, is that he would return to the United Kingdom. Whether he would then return to being a working royal, probably, because what else is he going to do? He's not, he's not particularly clever. He's not going to be an entrepreneur. And what he would do best is actually roll his sleeves up and get his hands dirty. That's what seems to, from a reading of Spare, make him content and happy. And what he really ought to have done is gone, if he wanted to sort of get away from the goldfish bowl that is the royal family he should have gone to africa whenever you read about his time there you do gain the impression that that brings him genuine contentment and the celebrity lifestyle isn't him in the slightest but he goes along with that because it's what his wife wants and if he doesn't go along with that she'll bring out the tasers and apply them to his pink pots so he has to go along with it and it's Africa where he would be most content. So it might be the case that if he was to return to the United Kingdom, he would look at trying to get some role, which would enable him to spend quite a bit of time in Africa, involving conservation projects, etc., linked to the royal family. And I think that would make him far more content and happy, certainly more than he is now, being a devalued victim of a narcissist. And before we wrap up, what are your thoughts on Andrew Tate? And lastly... Question after that, what can people expect from your channel and where can they find you? Because I'm really hoping this year you look into Brian Koberger and do some more analysis on him because I messaged you last year to, I was like, you need to do the Tinder swindler and you did it and you did a bit more on like your, your private page, which people can donate to. But I'm so invested in Brian Koberger and the Andrew Tate case. I'm just, I'm looking forward to your analysis, but carry on sorry well with with andrew tate i've identified that he's a narcissist an obvious one he doesn't operate with a facade and i have 
done a handful of videos about him explaining why I reached that conclusion and then also explaining uh, how his recent uh, incarceration impacts upon him and why he does as he does. Andrew Tate, of course, there's been a sort of moral panic about him in terms of his influence over uh, young men and that he's viewed as a individual that uh, propagates uh, misogynistic uh, attitudes, etc., and is abusive. Uh, Andrew Tate is actually a symptom of many of the problems rather than the problem itself. He's certainly a problem for the people that are on the receiving end of his abuse, but he's actually a symptom. And what he's done, guided by his narcissism, is tap into the fact that there's a large strata of men who are cut adrift by society. They're more likely than women to commit suicide, I think three or four times more likely. They're many times more likely to suffer from substance abuse and drink issues. They're more likely to face unemployment. They're more likely to have difficulties in dealing with um, securing uh, meaningful careers, etc. So they, not all of course, but a certain section of them, feel left behind because so much of the world now caters to minorities, catering to people who are gay and bisexual, who are trans, who are minorities and by reference to race and their ethnic makeup, etc. So there's a large swathe of men that feel that there's a lot that caters towards women and supporting them, and they have been cut adrift. And Tate has picked up on this, so he's got some nous in that regard, and what he's done is he has created, through his narcissism, this idea that and you basically go around and bang women and treat them like an object and drive fast cars and you can make a load of money, etc., that that's reclaiming being a man in effect. And if you follow what I tell you to do in the way that you treat people and specifically how you treat women, you'll be successful and you should go back to sort of being that chest-beating individual. Now, all of this is driven by his narcissism, that he has no emotional empathy for the individuals that he abuses, nor does he have any emotional empathy from those, of course, that he seeks to guide. He's simply using them as a means to get to the prime aims for himself. He's an obvious example of a narcissist, and as I often mentioned, it quite entertains me because he looks like a talking toe, and he's very see-through the way that he behaves, but I understand why he's been kept successful, because he has tapped into a large section of society that has been abandoned or feels abandoned, and therefore one has to say, well, yeah, he's met with that success. Of course, his narcissism, with his collateral consequences, has meant that he's ended up where he's ended up at the current time. And I should imagine on day 179, he finds himself charged with a variety of uh, offences appertaining to the allegations of sex trafficking. So those are some of my views in relation to Andrew Tate and to understand more about him, as I've mentioned, there are videos. And those videos can be found on my channel, which is HG Tudor, Knowing the Narcissist, the Ultra, which is on YouTube. I also have a blog, Narcsite, N-A-R-C-S-I-T-E.com, where there are thousands of articles that you can read to understand more about my viewpoint of the world and that of my kind and practical information. There's a knowledge vault, which can be accessed in the menu bar at narcsite.com and in the video description on YouTube, with over 200 products that both educate you and entertain you. And if you need to access my specialist advice and expertise, you can organize an audio consultation with me details again in the video descriptions or in the menu bar thousands of people have done so and have found that i've been able to assist them in understanding what they've been dealing with and achieving freedom so i'd encourage anybody listening who thinks they're involved with a narcissist whether it's romantically or in their family socially or work to access that channel and my blog and i also have a presence under hg tudor knowing the narcissist on twitter and also on uh, Facebook and you can access a lot of material for free and then if you need any more you can access the paid services also and find your way to freedom. And what can people who start following your channel or are already following it what can they expect from content that you're going to be pumping out over the next couple of months and what's your main focus this year? Uh, forthcoming work uh, there will still be an eye kept on Harry's wife because she's just so prominent and so many people 
like to watch those videos, although I find her boring. Um, there's going to be further analysis of famous and infamous people, which will also include true crime material as well. I know people find that interesting. There's going to be more work on empaths. There's going to be series which will be telling you more about the various schools and what all of that involves, and also the cadres. There's going to be more work about my psychopathy, specifically about that, and particular material which tells you the differences between a pure narcissist, a narcissistic psychopath, and a pure psychopath. So there's a lot more work to come. I'm going to. I've also started narrating my books. So the audio books are finally going to start being made available. It's going to take a bit of time because there's a huge body of work to get through and there's a, it takes a while to narrate them, but your glorious narrator is doing that, so they'll be available. And I will also be looking at trying to complete other written works that have been started, for example, Little Boy Lost and Asylum of the Grotesque, The Creature, amongst other things. So much to enjoy and plenty for the Ultra to get on with. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy and don't forget to give my podcast a rating and a follow. See you soon.